So hello and welcome to Scientist Warning to Deep TV. And today I am really pleased to have as our guest Guy Dauncey. Guy describes himself as an author, a futurist and an anthropological economist. So that's one to rehearse if you haven't heard that one before. He's the author of several books, including The Climate Challenge, 101 Solutions to Global Warming, Journey to the Future, A Better World is Possible, and he's been acclaimed by David Suzuki, amongst others. His forthcoming book is on the economics of kindness. He's based in British Columbia, Canada, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, a fellow of the Findhorn Foundation, which I, I know well, um, and held a chair in public policy at Arizona State University. So Guy, welcome. Thank you so much for finding the time to fit us in. My pleasure. Super, okay. Um, so I know it's morning there with you, so thank you for taking the time out. Um, the first question I'd like to ask you as someone who has been in this space for quite a long time is, you know, you've observed numerous governments come and go. You've obviously witnessed the first scientist warning to humanity in 92, then there was a second one as if we needed a second one in 2017. And then a couple of decades now of um, failed COP events. Um, conferences of the parties. What do you think has gone wrong? Well, I'm not sure anything has gone wrong as such in terms of our approach to how we are tackling this major crisis. I think that the being in the in the heart of the environmental movement and the climate movement, I see 99% of the discussion related to climate and the urgency of climate issues, and almost no discussion related to the other great wave of historical change, which is a balance between egalitarianism and elite kleptocracy. <laughs> so from 1860 through till 1914, the elites you know, grabbed more and more money for themselves and they got more and more corrupted. And then, then World War I hit and it really shattered everyone. In between combination of World War I and the depression call allowed the New Deal to come in and a sense of responsibility in government, which brought in healthcare, pensions, you know, unemployment insurance, all sorts of good things. And that wave ran out in 1980. And since then, the impulse has been by elite corporations and bankers to sort of focus entirely on individual wealth and gain and corporate wealth and gain. And it's now it's, that's at a crescendo with, with Donald Trump. So that, that historical wave overrides progress on things that are in classical economics known as externalities. So the climate crisis is just an externality. And the, the driving impetus by hedge funds, by large global investment funds, by corporations is maximize shareholder value. And the economic models they follow it's, um, are all completely derisive of environmental stuff. It's only public pressure that makes them maybe lean in that direction. So I think we need to combine our analysis of, of the climate crisis with an analysis of how we get the political economic change to overthrow that rule by dominators and bring back rule by cooperators, which includes cooperation with, with other people and with the earth. And that balancing tension between domination and cooperation goes right back to our shared genes with, with chimpanzees, our primate ancestors who lived in a very hierarchical alpha male must dominate world, which Trump absolutely epitomizes. Mm. And yet we also have 300,000 years of hunter gatherer background when our ancestors said, no, we will not allow domination. We will suppress domination in favor of living cooperatively in an egalitarian way. So that tension has, has always been there in fact, we were, the, the last two or 300 years, ever since the Enlightenment, has seen a huge impulse in more cooperative behavior. The very presence of democracy um, just didn't exist for thousands of years before that. It's inherently more democratic. And so that then is linked to people not having a clear vision of the future. Like where are we going as a planet? So people, a lot of people believe semi-consciously or subliminally that the purposes inherent in the Enlightenment have vanished and evaporated and gone away. So where are we heading as a civilization? And among my friends, you know, a number of people believe by default, well, we're heading for collapse and it's all hopeless and blah, blah, blah. So they're even, they're even falling for some of the sort of fake news stories that are all gonna be extinct by 2025, which is, you know, if you're a teenager and you read that stuff, mm. it's very disturbing. So I believe that when we unite 
an understanding of our history with regard to economic and political change with the understanding of how we're abusing the environment and the climate and everything, we can mobilize enough, a, a broad enough coalition of people. So it's not just climate people arguing for climate change. It's, it's everyone needing change. Those who are homeless, those who are struggling under the affordable housing crisis, those who are concerned about racial injustice, those who are concerned about social injustice. They're all part of the same need to overcome the dominators who are just, or as this, I don't know if you've come to Sarah Che's new book, Kleptocracy on Corruption in America. It's a phenomenally important read. It only came out about two weeks ago. But oh, wow. No, I don't know that one, but great recommendation. He labels it cl the, klepto the kleptocracy. Yeah which is like the Greek hydra, it's got 10 heads and they <laughs> cut one off and more emerge, right? Yeah. And we're used to thinking of kleptocracy as being in Ukraine and, and Azerbaijan mm. or, or Nigeria, but she's saying it's right in the heart of America. It's a really good point. And um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we seem not to be used to is, is the fact the fact that in fact we, we the Western, you know, the West North America, Europe, we, we are actually the bad guys, you know, we're, we're, we're not the good guys in any of this. Um, in one of your presentations, you talk about an ocean of trouble and you talk about all of the, the factors that have given rise to this pretty, you know, pretty desperate situation yeah. that we're in. Um, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about, you know, about what you see as being part yeah. of that ocean of okay. trouble. Yeah. Just briefly, the ocean of trouble is, of course, the environmental emergency, the biodiversity emergency, and then other things like the housing crisis, we know about social injustice and inequality, but also the rising level of, of corporate debt and private debt. Um, government debt's another issue that I don't think is a crisis, but there's a, and if we see coming out of COVID a mass wave of, of evictions and personal debt and bankruptcies, it's going to really bubble into something toxic. So, the, so I, I spent a long time asking, what are the fundamental causes of these troubles? Because I can read ecological economics and I can read this, that, the other. And none of them really address the causes. And I, I determined there were just four fundamental causes. One is the ancient human tension between the impulse to dominate and the impulse to cooperate. And the impulse to dominate is now expressing itself in the need to maximize gain, maximize shareholder value, corrupt whatever you can to get as much oil out of the ground, as much coal out of the ground to keep on. That's fueling the climate crisis. Second is the false economic ideas which our economies follow, which are um, firstly, in fact, you know, Adam Smith's ideas, which are now expressed as neoclassical economics, mm. which in order to pretend that economics was a science, going back to the late 1800s, had to make believe that there was a unit of energy equivalent to the atom. And they chose homo economicus, who is always self-interested and selfish. Mm. And then they said that unit is a representative agent for all other humans in our mathematical formulae. So it is then assumed that human behavior is always selfish. Mm. And the things like nature are always an externality. So clearly that's crazy. And the, but the balancing theory of Marxist socialism is equally crazy because it's basically saying there are, in, there are huge historical forces based on class production, which take away human agency and will bring an inevitable workers revolution and blah, blah, blah. It's just not true. The third fundamental course is really simple. It's simple ecological ignorance. Mm. We've got people in boardrooms and CEOs who don't, can't explain the carbon cycle. We've got mm. you know, cabinet ministers who can't explain the carbon cycle. So they just don't begin to understand the nature of our ecological connections. And the fourth one, addressing the, the, the mobilizing force that causes humans to act and allow, put our agency into action is our vision of the future, our story that tells us where we're mm. going and I believe that that story has collapsed because the old Enlightenment story is now leading us into so much trouble. The new story, I believe, and I'm promoting, and Jeremy Lent as well, is for a new ecological civilization, which has got enough, enough amazing stuff in it to be, to be very motivating and thereby mobilizing as well. It's very uplifting. And of course, George Monbiot says the same thing. We, we need a new narrative, and we do. We desperately need that sense of, you know, a vision of the future and what it might look like. Um, before we go into the next question, another question I want to ask you also is, um, and I put the question to Bill Ripple too when I interviewed him, and that is after after so many years of of, of doing this and of being being motivated, how 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 does it actually feel to be where we are now and to reflect back on on years of you know frustrated attempts to change things and so forth? And what what keeps you going? Well, I, I can certainly mentally feel a bit exhausted. I mean, my first book on climate solutions came out in in, 19, in sort of year 2000. That's 20 years ago. Mm. 
laying out all the solutions, but lacking some of the economic analysis I now bring to it. Um, I have a saying that if you, if you think you understand the climate crisis and you haven't had that awful sinking feeling in your belly, you haven't understood it. <laughs> well, you really <laughs> understand how oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. That's a measure of, okay, you've got it now. This mm. is really frigging serious. Mm. And uh, yes, it's, it's frustrating, but as I look at the 2020s as the critical decade, I mean, it's, mm. not as ever, if, it's not as if we get to 2030 and we haven't achieved all this, everything is uh, give up and go home. Mm. But it is a very critical decade when so many things are gonna to come to a head. Well, absolutely, you know, the eve of, well, almost the eve of, uh, you know, a very big, possibly the biggest presidential election that we will see oh, yes. in, in the US. That's absolutely crucial. I'm urging everyone I know to, you know, make yeah. sure we do not get, end up with Trump again. So the, the second part of your question is how do I keep motivated? So yeah. people often ask me, my goodness, this is so bad. Do you feel optimistic or do you feel pessimistic? And I mm. said, I'm not playing in that game at all. Mm. If you're watching your favorite soccer team play, and they're 4-1 down, you know, with four minutes to go. And as long as you're not a Manchester United fan, they know what to do. You are, you're not, if you're, a, if you're an observer in the stands, you can be pessimistic or optimistic or pessimistic. But if you're a player, you're either determined or you're defeated. And if you're mm. defeated, you're absolutely no good mm. to the coach and you'll do, do a substitution. If you're determined, you just do whatever it takes. And I mentioned Manchester United because they have been past classes, class masters of scoring three goals in the last three minutes. <laughs> my <laughs> yeah, determination. They defeated my team, Newcastle, just last weekend <laughs> by doing that very thing, right? <laughs> and but everyone everyone loves that. Everyone loves that kind of thing when yeah. it happens, when we, when we turn things around. Yes. It's yeah. just determination. The determination does not stop and ask, well, what are the odds of my winning? Maybe we yeah. should. Yeah. Just bloody minded. You're just going to do whatever it takes as long as you've got breath in your lungs. It's and there are so many, yeah. there are so many good examples of progress we have made, yeah. and of, and of even the recent progress. I mean, 19, 2019, with mm -hmm. the, the the youth climate strikes and mm -hmm. the rise of Extinction Rebellion, were just yeah. phenomenally sort of exciting and empowering. And they, the fact that every government in the world, more or less, said yes, mm -hmm. yes, we got a climate emergency, and then went back to sleep. Exactly, exactly. But it's, which that's partly a measure of the fact that this yeah. Extinction Rebellion had a very weak analysis of the solutions yeah all they really said was like eliminate all emissions by 2025 set up a citizens assembly to tell you how to do it mm. we've known what the solutions are for years and years and years and they're mm. detailed and, and they need you know so just when you take the, the transition to electric vehicles you need to have legislation saying that by 2030 every new vehicle will be electric you need a major yeah. drive on electric bikes so that you know your your bikeifying every city to make it mm. safe and easy for people to cycle around as they do in Copenhagen because the amount of, of rare earth minerals and energy needed to make an electric bike are tiny compared to making an electric car so Absolutely. we know what the solutions are they require detailed knowledge I mean World War II was full of detailed practical solutions before you can't we, just say we, I mean and, and that's it so, sorry you're, you're, you know, you're, it's great that, you know, to talk with someone who's as animated as all of this as, as, as you are. Before we get on to that, though, um, I want to, I want to just talk a little bit about age, human agency and hope, because it seems mm. to be a bit of a battlefield at the moment. Um, I'm going to read a quote from Daniel Kahneman, um, you know, one of the psychologists that I, re yeah. you know, strongly um, respect, um, writing to George Marshall, I think, in response to Marshall's book. And he said, the bottom line is that I'm extremely skeptical that we can cope with climate change. To mobilize people, this has to become an emotional issue. It has to have immediacy and salience. A distant, abstract and disputed threat just doesn't have the necessary characteristic for seriously mobilizing public opinion. So he's, that's clearly a sort of pessimistic stance. And, and we kind of see that playing out in a sense in, in much the same way, you know, in the way that it's, you, you describe well with the, the football match, whereby some individuals, some scientists have quite literally given up um, and who will say that, that you know, I, I have heard, and they're in a minority, thankfully, but one or two people say that there is absolutely nothing that can be done because it's game over. Um, and in, as, a, as a sort of counterfoil to that, then there are, you know, there are those people who seem to have a kind of um, 
misplaced faith in you know technology will there are techno fixes that can save us and and that's that's a that's a, an extreme contrast to the, the the former position and somewhere in the middle i, I feel like lies the truth um but i feel that you know that, that the it's all over there's nothing that can be done denies denies us human agency and it's very demotivating and people like michael mann for example speak out very powerfully against this and say that you know that kind of position i won't i won't i won't label it because the label is quite pejorative but that kind of sense that there is nothing that can be done um is you know will be a self-fulfilling prophecy because we will not end up in a good place if we follow that line of thought so I wondered if what, what your thinking is in relation to um, agency and hope. Um, oh. uh, Jeremy, uh, just and um, just one final comment here. Um, I mean, Jeremy Lent puts it quite well, and he talks about hope as something that is in in the in the present tense, as opposed to a hope for the future. You know, hope is about how we live in the present. That feeling that nothing can be done is all that it destroys agency, will destroy everything. If you've got a marriage and it's not going well, you think, oh, well, nothing can be done, you're going to lose your marriage mm. because you're not doing anything about it. And one thing I've noticed for quite a long time is that most climate scientists are not climate solutions specialists. Mm -hmm. They, they feel obliged to be so. And there are some embarrassing situations when a climate scientist has suddenly grabbed onto nuclear power as the answer for everything, well, we'll plug in nuclear, because they really haven't studied it in detail. And one of the major platforms of putting solutions together um, is following from the sense of the climate emergency is the, the set of thinking that says, we need to address this as if it was World War II. And my colleague, Seth Klein in Vancouver, just two weeks ago, published this book called A Good War, which is subtitled Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. And he goes through the measures that were taken in 1940. The Crown Corporation, so that's Canadian terms, sort of the government departments that were set up to make war supplies, the massive mobilization. We have never seen anything remotely near that. Mm. For instance, in all the climate campaigns I come across, everyone, you know, the very beginning Nonprofits will say, here's what you can do as a homeowner. And people, the rest of us go, yeah, right. <laughs> but, but there's never been an organization that says, here's what you could do if, if we had the equivalent of the voluntary effort in World War II with air raid wardens and people training to do. So if it's just 2% of the people said, I'm going to be a climate leader. I'm going to get my whole house sold and, and vehicles to zero carbon within one year and then be a leader for all my neighbors. So that'd be 20 neighbors, which is 50 people. That covers the entire country. You just need 2% of people to be trained and step up as leaders, along with the, the policy solutions, the technical solutions, and all the government efforts. The, and another thing people don't understand, there is no financial problem to this. That The people say, well, we can't afford it. But, but central banks, whether it's the Bank of England or the Bank of Canada, create money out of thin air all the time. Mm. It goes back to our hunter-gatherer origins when we, if someone was sick or ill, we'd give without expect, expecting a reciprocal return. When private banks create money, it's a debt and has to be repaid. But central banks do it. They did it for the 2008, 2008 crisis. So governments can issue climate action bonds. Central banks can buy them using created money and therefore finance you know, all the, the, the hundred billion dollar loans needed to retrofit all our buildings, the investments in that stuff. There's no financial problem, but no one in the climate movement understands economics. But there's a horribly broad generalization. That's, yes, that's a scary prospect. That's an absolutely scary prospect. And clearly that's something that would need to be fixed. Yeah. Yes. And, and people like Adam Tooze, who's one of the world's you know, best known historians on, of economic historians, will say quite openly that a central bank can, um, a public bank, for instance, can issue loans but the central bank can underwrite them. So if the loan fails, they'll just write it off. And, and, and so there's no financial problem. And if we take a, war, a, a wartime emergency response thing, there's no political problem. We can do all this if we just really accelerate it quickly. But any goal set in the year 2050 is like a message to the civil servants, hey, go to sleep. Mm. It's not on your watch. It's, imagine in 1940, you know, at the end of the, the, the phony war, um, and Churchill said, look, you know, um, we really need to get the Navy organized. Can you get it done by, 90, by 1950? <laughs> it's just like, it, it, that's the kind of thinking with goals set in 2030. They're just 20, set in 2050. So the, 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 I think the climate solutions people need to work, you know, together to sort of really ramp up the vision of action on the ground as if 
we yeah. were equivalent to World War II. Yes, I, I agree. But how to make that happen? I'm obviously the million dollar question, but how how do we make that happen? You know, I'm 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 you know, I'm a critical friend to Extinction Rebellion. I'm obviously leading scientists warning. Um, and you know, for all of us, I think it's well, how how are we gonna have how are we gonna have impact? How are we going to make things happen? Well, I think first of all, we need to understand we do know what needs to be done. We do mm-hmm. not need to set up a citizens assembly to tell us what to do. That's a fun That's thing to do. Engage, it's like an excuse, like we don't know what to do yet. Let's ask the people. We do know what to do. OK. And then with each, within every political party, we need to go the next step on from he declared a climate emergency. These are the critical steps that need taking mm-hmm. to address you know, the emissions in general, plus the forestry emissions, plus the sort of meat and dairy emissions and, and tackle them head on. And then you've got to line up the political coalitions to do that. So that means, you know, working with ideally with the, the climate friendly politicians in all parties there are i mean that's that, that, that's an interesting proposition so just to give you an example here in the uk we've got the government declaring that they have an environment bill we have mm. the activists saying it's not going far enough and so there is in the uk a private members bill which is a climate and ecological emergency bill that goes further now if if it's if if governments if MPs in the UK for example or if politicians globally recognise that there is a climate and ecological emergency, um, and if they are at the same time not taking proportionate action, I mean clearly there's something preventing them from doing that. Be that you know vested interests of fossil fuel companies and corporations and so forth. So I'm saying that potentially there that you, there's the there there could be the political will, but something is preventing that from um, being enacted yeah. effectively. And I think you nailed it. I mean, that is the vested interests. Yeah. I mean, here in Canada, we have a, a government that's declared a climate emergency and says, you know, we're all out to do it. And then Justin Trudeau buys a controversial pipeline mm-hmm. to, to 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 expand the oil production. And actually, was quoted as saying in in you know, some in America, you know, what country would have gazillion tons of oil under the ground and not use it as if he just mm. hadn't made those connections mm. um but the progress on the climate action front um when you dig into it is going after the financing of all those major fossil fuel production producers and it's now going after their insurers mm-hmm. and we're getting success on that front so major banks are, are being i'm increasingly saying i'm going to pull out from financing the tar yeah. sands in canada which is our local struggle mm-hmm. so if you have natural gas fracking operations in britain or anything like that you need to the the, the movement needs to do more than just protest in the streets it needs to get very targeted on mm-hmm. who's financing those operations mm-hmm. and which insurance company is financing them and then go after the other um clients of those banks and insurance companies and put the pressure on to say we're going to ditch you we're, we're going to ditch you if you don't do this that's what brought down apartheid in south africa in terms mm-hmm. of the, the the boycott of barclays bank and the other banks was you know it started you know it was very powerful in putting pressure on the south african business community to soften and allow change to happen so you go yeah. straight after those vested interests. <laughs> totally agree. And I mean, and here in Cambridge, we've seen one recent example where my, my Extinction Rebellion friends um, have now persuaded, as if they needed persuading, um, the um, vice chancellor and, and those individuals who run Cambridge University to divest from fossil fuels. Um, yes. But, but, you know, the question is, why, why, you know, why, why did it take so much effort to, to actually force them to do something that's so blinking obvious well, what we um, forget and, and also just you know here in the uk you know we, we have a government that on the one hand is is proclaiming to be um gearing up for, for cop next year in glasgow but at the same time has announced that it will open a new coal mine in cumbria you know which is which which, yeah. which just does not make sense at all so so one wonders about well you know clearly we we have good reason to doubt the integrity of the government and, and good reason to not trust their their intentions and not trust their motives. I mean, clearly, with an issue, the coal mine in Cumbria is equivalent to a new tar sands operation. You mobilise every bit of pressure on the ground mm. to blockade and stop and make that a public issue and stop it happening, including mm. going after the financials and the insurance of that and the, and the labour unions who say they will get work for it. Because, you know, um, and then that's where the importance in the campaigning of a really solid pledge to all fossil fuel workers Mm-hmm. that they will have a path to an, a well-financed path to a new job or new career so that the, the people who are promoting the new fossil fuel projects can't say oh local people want jobs 
Mm. You can, there are so many jobs to be had in this transition, whether it's retrofitting houses or building wind and solar mm. or, or building bike lanes. There's no shortage of work. And if we can get that clear commitment by whichever political party is struggling for change, the you know, Labour or Plaid Cymru or the Scots, that there will be protection for fossil fuel workers and a, tra- a tr- path of transition to a new job with training and a new career. That removes a big part of the argument as to why we need the coal mines, because sometimes it's just they use the excuses for the jobs, which is always bullshit, right? Absolutely. And I think I think the same case was made around HS2, actually. Um, another question I'd like to put to you is... Um, so, for example, Lord Deben, who chairs the Committee on Climate Change in the UK, his, when, when he speaks, I've heard him speak a few times, he always says, you must put pressure on your local MP, write to your MP and ask that he or she takes action. And obviously that's not happening on a big enough scale. And I guess but I, I sometimes have a lingering worry that not enough people really care about what's happening and really care about the future. And you, you've been in this space much longer than me. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of relatively new to all of this. What, what's your sense? Do you feel that there's a, that we're getting a more of an upsurge of commitment and worry and concern? Well, there's certainly a, a, an upsurge of, of worry and concern. Mm. And purely negatively, when, whenever we in British Columbia have massive forest fires or massive smoke from forest fires in California and the sky is yellow and the sun's this strange mm. disc, that leads to more progressive voting in the next election. Because people are saying, I don't know what, I don't understand this climate crisis, but it's really troubling me. I'm going to vote for a party that's got a strong commitment on climate. Mm. So that plays into the fact. So the earlier point you raised, Alison, about um, people feeling not impacted by it is very true. You mentioned someone who's saying, so people do, those impacts like forest fires for us do strike home. Now in Britain, it's more likely to be massive flooding or massive mm. storms, I think, but they those are climate related. And I've forgotten the first part of your question there. <laughs> it was, no, sorry, <laughs> it's sort of meandering slightly. Um, I was wondering whether whether you have a sense of people really, really caring. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the, the, the other part in terms of mobilization, what I observe mm. locally is that 99% of the mobilization is attached to a nonprofit organization taking initiative and asking for help in doing it. Mm-hmm. So in British Columbia, we have about 10 organizations that are clearly taking leadership, or actually, if you count all the smaller ones, it's more like 300, but 10 major ones that are taking initiative on stuff and always asking their supporters, join us in this, join us in that, meet us here, do this, do that. So the leadership is there. It's very difficult for an individual to know what to do and to mm. not feel I'm just on my own. It's like in World War II, if there was mm. no one organizing the army and some, and the government said, well, but you need to go and fight the Germans. Like, you'd look around and say, well, <laughs> hello. Yeah. The army was organized and so people yeah. could join it. The Home Guard was organized. The Red mm. Cross was organized. Oxfam mm. was organized. So people had a way mm. to express themselves. And so Extinction Rebellion is, is weak in that it, it's... I believe that the local groups are getting us self-organizing, but you know, yeah. um, to the extent that they can be more autonomous and do their own thing, which I know mm. can lead to, to crazy action sometimes, but mm. and, and focus less on actual street protests and more on very targeted actions against insurers, against um, particular companies, against particular coal mines, take on particular initiatives and really drive it home. Mm. I observe that stuff having results. Okay, it, but it's that's but good it's, to hear. It, yeah. it, it, there, are, there are that many different places where action is needed. It's great to hear. Yeah. So, sorry, um, I'm, I'm certainly in the UK where, you know, which birthed Extinction Rebellion, and I'm sort of very pleased to be part of the early part of that. But in the US, it's not really taken off. What, what do you, and obviously you're in Canada, so maybe, you know, maybe you're not so well placed to comment on the US, but what will it take to bring the US to the table? Will it, will it, I mean, it's not just going to be getting rid of Donald Trump, you know, because Biden has his own, you know, has his own issues and downside. So so the climate movement in America Mm. is stronger than in any other country. Mm -hmm. That's, that's contradictory to what you just said. Yeah. The last year, everything has been submerged under sort of the, you know, get Trump out, that Mm. side of things. But the massive climate movement demonstrations that were held in New York City, wherever, just phenomenal. Mm. 400, 500,000 people, really strong. Mm. And the leadership was very strong. And at the state level, whether it's it's, it's Washington, Oregon, you know, New York, Vermont, there's been a lot of real 
solid progress there. So with the White House, if the White House was back on board and if Congress, if, if there was a democratic majority for the White House and Congress and the Senate, and we'll leave the Supreme Court up there as a bubble because it, got, it has the potential to sabotage everything, mm -hmm. you will see some very strong climate legislation coming through. And you'll see America back at the leadership table working on this stuff because the, the fact that the, the, the lobbyists have really connected with um, racial justice and with the, the need for mm -hmm. social and employment justice and jobs and that piece in particular is very important. So people are no longer so, well, you know, the, the belief that if you do climate solutions, it'll destroy the economy, which is the number one Trump line is, is the hundred yeah. percent wrong if, if climate solutions in action, which is the great new transition, it's the equivalent of moving from horses to, 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 to cars. Yeah. Over the it's a massive economic infusion of investment and jobs and technology upgrades. Why would you not mm. want to do that? Absolutely. So, so that particular argument, it's not political, it's, it's not left or right. It's just like, it's like an inherent progress of technology away from, from you know, older, more inefficient technologies such as fossil fuels towards the, you know, the efficiency of electric revolution. Mm. Why would you not want to do that as a country? Well, Clean air. Well, well, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, clearly there are vested interests that are getting in the way yes. of people yes. imagining and envisioning what a future might actually look like. Okay, um, a final, it's not so much a question, but I suppose it's a kind of request for a comment from you, really, which is... So to, to, to the ordinary, because our, our audience is citizen scientists and largely ordinary people, what, what would you say to an ordinary person who's concerned about what's happening and doesn't really know what to do? What would be your, your message to that person? I would say look around your local community and find a group that's already engaged in doing something and join it. And if that group doesn't exist, form one. You know, to get together three or four friends who think the same way and let's form, you know, Ash Beyond the Green Climate Action Group or whatever it might be. And then start learning and reading and linking up with the other groups so that you know you're part of a much wider movement. Because none of us are in this alone and nobody can solve this alone. It's all together we can do this. But when you form a group and a part of that group, if that group is well managed and it, and it nurtures its relationships it is very fulfilling, it's rewarding, you're getting friendships out of it, you're getting community, you're getting a shared sense of doing things together, a shared sense of achievement when you, when you manage to do something. If you say you persuade a local college to sort of you know, ditch its, its, its climate, its um, fossil fuel investments, or you persuade a local council to put in regulations about allowing bike lanes, whatever it is, you can, you're not on your own anymore. Um, people in the 1930s who knew what Hitler was doing and saw nothing happening felt very alone including Churchill, because mm -hmm. they thought, oh my God, this terrible thing's happened, no one knows. But once, once the, the, the war had been declared and people linked in, there was a phenomenal surge of solidarity and action together to tackle this crisis. Yeah, and, I, and, and others have spoken also about the, you know, the need for that sort of something like a, you know, a World War II effort. And I think, I mean, that, yeah. that point really, really resonates. I think it's very well made. Um, so yeah, and I think also the talking about it really you know obviously it's going to really really help people so so thank you thank you so well, much for your time any well, other well, final... yes there is a final thought because we haven't i mean okay. obviously there's a parallel there's a parallel biodiversity crisis yes and and the linkage is that there's not the, the solutions there are two fundamental solutions to the climate crisis one is it one is to because the cause is not off our greenhouse gas emissions it is our accumulated greenhouse gas emissions if we all went to zero carbon tomorrow morning We've still got 300 gigatons of surplus carbon. Yeah. So drawing that surplus carbon down mm. involves the same solutions that address the biodiversity crisis, organic farming, sustainable forestry, stuff like that. Yeah. And, so, and so then when you tie it to the biodiversity crisis, the, this sense of a new vision of a new ecological civilization begins to appear over the horizon. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the turning our farmlands to regenerative farming, restoring our forests, making our cities green and blossoming with creeks and trees and roofs and stuff like green roofs. And this is joyful. This is mm -hmm. wonderfully enriching. This is it's part of what, you know, George Monbiot talks about, you know, allowing the wilding to come back into life. And Absolutely. so many people long for that in their soul. So if we talk that language yeah. as well about the restoration of nature. I think many more people will come on board. Yep, I agree. And I think what's been interesting about COVID, and obviously it's been very distressing for a huge number of people, especially those people who've lost loved ones. But I think what a lot of people have been saying is that they've actually taken the time to go to go for a walk when we haven't been under under lockdown. 
um, and to spend more time in nature and to, to enjoy it. And, and with no cars, I mean, the one thing I hate at the moment, I wake up and I can hear the cars again. It's just horrible. Um, yes. OK, well, thank you. So we obviously, there's the, the, you know, many more conversations we could have. But thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely fascinating. So um, for those of who've watched and listened to this, if you enjoyed this, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much, everyone. Our pleasure, Alison. Thanks very much. Thank you.